Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. I'm your host, Eddie Trask. This week's guest, it's, it's a real honor to have Brian um, Mercier on my channel. He runs Catholic Truth on YouTube, a channel I've been following for several years now, and I can't wait to hear his testimony. I want to mention a few more things about him. Uh, he's a professional Catholic speaker, a retreat leader, Catholic apologist, of course, and an author. And first of all, Brian, welcome to the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I was telling Brian right before we uh, got on the, the call here that, you know, I really appreciate the fact that he has done so many videos that have been so helpful from an apologetic standpoint. And he does something that not a lot of people do or take time to do. And that is he responds to comments. When, when you go to his YouTube videos, you will see that he is in the trenches and he's really seeking to help people understand what misconceptions they have and how to uh, charitably correct and make sure that we keep the mission going forward. So anyway, with that, Brian, I just wanted to say thanks again. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. If I uh, <coughs> cough a little bit, it's because I just got over COVID. So I'm just you know, little repercussions, but uh, I'm better. Good. Yeah. Uh, what would you like me to talk about? I want to hear, you know, I, I read something that talked about uh, this, I think around college time, there was a, a conversion that happened. So I was hoping you could talk about the stage of life leading up to that, you know, kind sure. of teen, teen years and what you were like. And um, yeah, I think we'd like to start there. Yeah, I once got in a conversation with an atheist at a pool uh, near my house, and uh, she was reading Fifty Shades of Grey, so naturally I had to talk to her, and uh, it led to a conversation about why she be didn't believe in God, and we had this whole conversation back and forth, and I ended up you know, telling her, hey, I can answer any question you have about God, I can answer any question you have about the faith, you know, so just shoot, feel free to ask me any questions you want, so she started asking me questions. And we had a great conversation. And eventually it came down to why would I want to follow God? I don't really need him. You know, I'm happy. I have my boyfriend. I have my cat. I have my family. I pretty much have everything I need. So even if God does exist, you know, no offense to the big guy, but like, I don't feel like I need him. I'm pretty happy right now. And so I went on to tell her, you know, you got to start, you know, with the end in view you know, this world isn't going to last forever. You're going to die. <laughs> you know, your boyfriend might break up with you, you know, and your cat's definitely going to die before you. Your parents are old. They're going to die before you. It's, it's conceivable that you're going to lose everything you love. And then what do you have? And so she's, that really hit her. And she's like, I never thought about that before. And I said, you know, like God is the one who's always there through the good and the bad, through life and through death, through everything. He's the one who was there in the beginning. He's going to be the one there at the end. And I went on to share my testimony, whether that even if you're happy now, you can be a hundred times happier with God. And I told her how I used to uh, dress in black, all black, head to toe. I used to carry weapons. I used to want to hurt people, kill people. I used to write poems about it all the time. I did like crazy psychotic things. And, and she was like, what you, you're so nice. You're so happy. I can't imagine you ever being like that. And that's what most people say when they understand what I used to be like. And, you know, I wasn't the worst kid in the world by far. I grew up in a Catholic family praying the rosary every day, going to mass every Sunday, going to confession once a month. Uh, but I was very angry. I had a very abusive uh, family at the time. I went through a lot of abusive things, was bullied a lot in school. And so it made me very depressed, very sad a lot. And I was happy on the outside, but sad and dying on the inside. And year after year after year of that, it just started to become really depressed and really angry. It turned into anger. And uh, a lot of people remember what happened at Columbine when those two people shot up the school just because they were bullied a lot and pushed over the edge of their psychological capacities. And that's kind of what was starting to happen to me. Good kid, prayed the rosary, but starting to you know, lose it, you know, mentally. I was like, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, one way on one day, one day on the next. And, and so, yeah, I started uh, studying martial arts. I started um, writing poetry about all the people I hated and all the people I wanted to take out and all the sadness of how I'm never going to find love and find friendship. And my other friends started dressing in black with me. And sometimes we did stupid things like sit in railroad tracks and, you know, go look for fights and went, uh, well, I won't say some of the stuff I did because it's like, <laughs> probably get arrested, even though it was so long ago, yeah. but you know, like it was a lot of bad stuff. My mom was really worried about me and she actually was going to, she actually wanted to call the cops on me because she didn't know what else to do with me. And so she's like, if Brian goes to jail, 
you know, hopefully he'll get his life in, you know, together and he'll come out a better, stronger person, but she couldn't pull the trigger. She couldn't call the cops on me like she wanted to. Uh, and so she decided to do something else. She decided to send me to a Catholic college, <laughs> try and get some Jesus in me. And uh, so she sent me out to Franciscan University of Steubenville, you know, best Catholic college in America, no bias. And uh, that's where I went. Didn't really want to. to at the, I, me and my friends were calling it stupid bill, Stupidville before I even got there. Because, I mean, if it's a real Catholic college, I mean, the kids probably don't even you know, play video games. They probably don't play sports. They probably don't have fun. They probably just become priests and nuns. And that was my attitude at the time. And I really didn't want to go there. And I went there cursing like every other word and, you know, throwing the F-bombs just to shock people there. And and that's kind of where God was going to change my life, you know, because everyone there was the opposite of high school and the opposite of the abuse I had. Nobody cared what my background was. Nobody cared how much of a horrible person I was. Nobody cared that I did X, Y, and Z. They just loved me and they welcomed me and they hugged me. And they were like, you know, you're the best person, Brian, come on, come join us for lunch. And I was like, really? You want to hang out with me? And no matter what I did, I couldn't shake these people. They were all just so ridiculously nice. And I, I actually got mad at them sometimes. I was like, you guys are a little too nice. You're a little too culty. If you ask me, I was like, nobody in the world is this nice. Nobody smiles all the time. Nobody's happy all the time, but you guys are all crazy here. And then when I was, you know, alone on my own once I was thinking, you know, I'm just mad at them because I can't think of the last time that I was actually truly happy inside. I can't remember the last time, like I didn't act happy. Yeah, sure. I had happy times. I had lots of friends. We did fun things, but it never took away that pain and that death and that despair inside. I felt like I had a hurricane every day of my life. I felt like I was carrying a thousand pound heart through my life. And uh, so it was Long story short, you know, I had a very, very, very powerful encounter with God, a St. Paul style encounter, you know, where I got knocked off my horse, so to speak. And uh, God gave me a roundhouse kick to the face and it was so powerful and it ended up like changing my whole life. He took out all of the hate and he replaced it with love. He took out all of the pain and the sadness and he replaced it with an overflowing joy that I never could imagine and probably couldn't have in a hundred lifetimes. I had so much joy, so much peace everything was overflowing. And I just was completely transformed from the inside out. And I told God that I would live for him only for him, all for him, you know, forever, because he changed my life. And of course, that's the very, you know, short story. There's a lot more details, but you know, he did change my life. And so I said, I wanted to live for him. I want to tell everybody about him. I mean, when I was set on fire, my heart was set on fire. And I realized how awesome God is and how many I looked into the world. And I saw how many people were broken and hurting and abused and uh, just lost, losing faith, anxiety, and all of that, I said, wow, God, there's so many people who need you and who need what I now have. So I want to help bring you to as many people as possible in the world. And uh, so that's kind of where I got the idea to start ministry and really wanting to help people to be happy, to find peace and to find what truly matters in life. And that's Jesus. So, so you were in your early twenties and you said, when you say ministry, this wasn't directly into apologetics necessarily. This was no, just, Hey, I, just I want you I to know to... Jesus. I want you to yeah. understand. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it started at college, you know, just helping people, you know, cause I had the lowest self-esteem on the face of the planet. I hated myself, hated, hated myself. Didn't even look in the mirror for seven years. Cause I hated what I saw. Thought it was the ugliest person on planet earth. I'd never get a girlfriend. I'd never get married. I just was stupid and ugly and dumb. And the list goes on. And uh, <clears throat> one day on the way to class, all these people were just so happy to see me, even though I was in a bad mood. And they were like, hey, Brian, how are you? And I'd be like, oh, I'm not good today. And they'd be like, that's great. Have a great day, Brian. I'm like, are you deaf? I was like, do you have a hearing problem? I said, I'm not good. You know, I still had a little bit of an attitude yeah. at the time, but uh, I realized that everyone who saw me was so happy. You know, they, I just, they literally lit up. So I was like, huh. So I forced myself to look in the mirror for the first time in seven years. I said, okay, God clearly doesn't make junk. So people say, so I'm going to, all right, I have to have a gift and maybe making people happy is my unknown gift. So, you know what? In addition to trying to bring people to Jesus, I'm also going to try and make people happy. I'm going to try and cheer them up. I'm going to give lots of hugs, tell jokes, be there to listen when they need it. And instead of narcissistically focusing on me, I'm dumb, I'm bad, I'm this, I'm that, which is literally the recipe for low self-esteem. I turned it around. I said, I'm going to go help people. I'm going to make them happy. I'm going to cheer them up. I'm going to listen to them. And it ended up making me the most popular, one of the most popular people on college campus. Cause 
I didn't even do that much except stop obsessively focusing on myself and started focusing on other people. And from there, as my conversion in Jesus grew and he just filled me so much more, I just wanted to tell everyone else about what I had. And that led me to, um, you know, it eventually led me to run into a wall when I went home and nobody cared, (laughs) first of all. But then it led me into apologetics because I started going and praying in Pittsburgh and uh, in front of an abortion mill. And all these Jehovah's Witnesses were there, uh, fundamentalists were there, evangelicals, people who hated the Catholic Church, and they were there trying to convert Catholics. And I quickly learned that I couldn't explain my faith I couldn't, um, you know, explain it to save my soul, really. (laughs) And so I ended up running off, screaming into the night, going to look for answers every week because I engaged these people or they would engage me and I didn't know what to say. So I would go look up the answers and bring them back the next week. They'd have more. I'd go look them up six months later. I'm starting to learn about my faith a year later. I'm knowing a lot about my faith. And now sometimes they need to go look up the answers. And so, you know, that's kind of how it all started, you know, my love for Christ, but also the love for the Catholic faith. And when I came home from college, I realized how many people just weren't Catholic, didn't care about the Catholic faith, were bored by the Catholic faith, didn't get good answers. So many of us have good questions and they did not get good answers. I didn't get good answers. I grew up asking, well, how do we know God exists? How do we know that, you know, God is loving? Why would he send people to hell if he's loving? Why doesn't he answer my prayers? I've been praying every day faithfully. He doesn't answer my prayers. And people would just say, oh, you just have to believe. Oh, you just have to have more faith. Oh, you know what? God's a mystery. And I said, you know what? Those are dumb answers. That just means you don't know the answer to my questions. And so I've spent the last 25 plus years looking up all the answers to my questions since no one else would give them to me. And now I try to give them to everyone else in the world, uh, you know, so they don't have to be as awkward as I was when talking to other religions and just so they can have a greater, more solidified faith and come to know God more. Amazing. And would you say you've run into a lot of Catholics that were like you, not necessarily the anger, mm-hmm. but not knowing what they believed and, and not understanding like conversion of heart and just kind of going out into the world saying, I'm Catholic, I'm Catholic, I'm Catholic, but they don't know what that means. Did you, have you yeah. found a lot of that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> pretty much all of them, right? I mean, so many people go to church on Sunday. They go to church every Sunday. They've been going to church every Sunday for years and they don't, it doesn't really change us that much, you know, because we don't understand why we're there. You know, no one's really taught us how to pray in a deep way that connects with God. Sure. We all say prayers, but very few of us pray prayers in a way that changes our hearts and our lives and our minds. Uh, I knew a guy who prayed every day for 10 years and he said it did nothing. You know, he was in jail and uh, I was going into the woods to read and God spoke to me and told me, no, go down and read by the hospital. And I was like, uh, okay. So I turned around and walked a quarter mile down to the hospital. And there's this huge guy standing. I mean, the hospital was under construction. So they literally had a fence around it. The only place you could go was like a patch of grass outside of the fence. And so that's where I went. And there's this huge, huge guy standing there. He just got out of prison that day. And he's like, are you a Christian? Didn't even say hi or anything. He's just like, are you a Christian? I'm like, yeah. He's like, are you a Catholic? I'm like, yeah. He's like, do you read the Bible? I'm like, are you going to kill me? <laughs> and uh, I was like, yeah, I read the Bible. And uh, he said, good, because I've been in prison. Some lady gave me a uh, rosary and I've been praying it. And I've been praying to God. I just want to know that I can be forgiven. And I don't feel like God loves me. I don't feel him. I don't experience anything. I just, I still feel like he hates me. And so I said, you know, that's because people haven't really taught us how to pray deeply. So I prayed with him and it ended up changing his life. He had this huge encounter with God. He was crying. His shirt was soaked by the time he was done, you know, praying the prayer soaked. I mean, so much that was bouncing off onto his pants. It was like saturated. And, um, So God's allowed me to help so many people. Our catechesis has been so abysmal for the last 50 years in this church. And it's not necessarily the church's fault. It's families. Families have not been living their faith. Families have dropped the ball. Families have not educated their kids. Families have not passed on their kids. And then we expect, you know, religious education to just do it once a week. That's like sending your kids to school once a week to take math. And then they never think of it again. And they don't do the homework. They don't do anything except for that once a week. And they don't even pay attention while they're there. And we expect them to know math, you know, so it's a huge problem in the church right now This we don't know our faith and we are not successfully passing it on to the future generations. In fact, we've lost probably three generations now. And all the pupils have said that Catholics are at the bottom for passing on the faith. And so that's one of my great passions is to help people have what 
I have and to know their faith, love their faith, live their faith, and to be set on fire for their faith, because then it ceases to be boring and it ceases, and it becomes life changing. Absolutely. And what I've noticed about your videos and in, in the defense of the faith, maybe this is just how I view it. I feel like there are numerous <laughs> stages here, but you're not amped to defend until you have an affinity, a strong passion for what you're defending. There will be people that may say, I'm going to defend it just because I know I'm Catholic and, I, and I've got to learn these things versus a person that is in love with learning first and then saying, how do I defend? Because I know how I got to this point, but how do I defend such, such an affinity for this, for this faith? You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I think um, I see a lot. I went to a lot of counselors when I was ki a kid, obviously <laughs> my parents tried to send me to counseling. Didn't really work too much. Um, but you know, I noticed a lot of counselors had no idea what they were talking about. I could tell, you know, and I even know people who want to go into counseling, but they haven't worked out the problems in their own life yet. You know, and so I appreciate the fact, I love the fact that they want to help others, but they never got from point A to point B in their own life. So I'm wondering how they can help other people to get point, from point A to point B if they haven't figured it out. And so thankfully, you know, God allowed me to get from point A, miserable to point B, you know, healed, loving, you know, kind, totally different than I was. And so I feel like I have a gift now to be able to help other people through that. And in fact, I went last year, I help out at a Catholic camp every year. And uh, one girl talked to me and said, she said she was going to commit suicide. She was going to kill herself. And she just had all these problems and, you know, that sort of thing. And so I talked to her for a very long time, you know, and I poured my heart out to her about my problems that I used to have and how I struggled and how I can understand what she's going through, you know, and how the world doesn't understand us a lot of times, blah, blah, blah. And uh, about a year later, I mean, I never heard anything from her, but I, a year later, I heard from another counselor that she didn't commit suicide. And the biggest reason she didn't was because of the conversation that we had. She said that was the biggest thing that influenced her not to, you know, pull the trigger, so to speak. And so God has blessed me to help so many people. And, uh, you know, I always say that, you know, you talk about, you know, really being passionate for the faith versus just you know, doing it. But the reality is if you, it's like, if you don't love a movie, why would you want to tell anyone about it? <laughs> if you thought a movie was okay, you probably still wouldn't tell anyone about it. But if you loved a movie and you were like, wow, that was the best movie. What is the first thing you do? You go tell everybody. So if you love something and you're passionate about it, of course you want to go tell everybody. And that's how I am with the faith. I mean, Jesus changed my life so much. I never knew that you could have so much peace, so much happiness, so much joy. And that doesn't mean my life's perfect because I still went through hard times. But I, even through the hard times, I had a rock. I had a light. I had hope. I, it was way different than the old hard times I went through. And if anyone knew, you know, what it really is to worship God and just not to go through the motions, you know, and be bored by it, they would want it too. So it's like a great movie. I just, honestly, I can't help but tell everyone about it, even if they get annoyed <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> oh, that's great. What, what are the common, I'm always curious about this, especially someone in your uh, position, you've seen so many conversions people sharing their stories in the comment sections for example and you know weighing in on videos that you've made five years ago uh what are some of the common i guess pillars that fell for them that made them say okay i'm in i i'm in the faith makes sense because of this thing or this thing what what have you seen well, it really depends on the person, their individual struggles. I think understanding where they're coming from first is the most important thing, not just throwing out answers, you know, but really loving them, accepting them where they're at, not judging them, not trying to force them to be where you are, but, you know, being where they're at and loving them there. I think, you know, love is a huge uh, factor. Acceptance in, in, in modeling the love of Jesus is a huge factor in helping people to come to him, you know, because a lot of people don't know him. And, you know, the, the famous saying, you know, you might be the only Bible that some people might read. And if they read you as a Bible, would they want to come closer to Christ? You know, and you might be the only Jesus that they might see, you know, until they come to him. And if they knew by knowing you, would they want to know Christ more? So, you know, a lot of it is our example in the way we treat people and the way we love people. That's why I try to be nice to everybody, kind to everyone, even if they're not so nice, you know, kind of a jerk, you know, yelling at you, screaming at you. I try to be nice and kind uh, to them nonetheless. Um, 
but you know, it really depends if it's an atheist or a Protestant, you know, but really just kindly finding their biggest uh, struggle, their biggest misunderstanding, their objections and answering that. Um, you know, for atheists, a lot of it is suffering, you know, you know, I don't understand why God would allow this bad thing to happen. I don't know. I don't understand why God would allow my grandmother to die, you know, and so, you know, you touch on those emotional points and help them to see the bigger picture. Well, you know, they're much more likely, you know, to come back. And I've had so many atheists and so many fallen away Catholics say, you know, if I knew this stuff beforehand, I never would have left the church. If I knew these beforehand, you know, I would still be Catholic today. And this makes so much sense. So thank you for explaining it to us. And for Protestants, most Protestants have no idea what the, uh, the Catholic church believes. They've only heard it from other people who don't know what the Catholic church believes. So really apologetics is just clearing up people's misconceptions, their misunderstandings, their objections, and helping them to see on that level. And honestly, that's why I started Catholic Truth, because I wanted to take my ministry. I mean, when I first got out of college, I just started, I didn't know what to do. I just started doing confirmation retreats because I just wanted to speak to people, get in front of people, tell people about Jesus. And um, it started very slowly. And then I started teaching confirmation. I eventually got a youth ministry job. You know, anything that had to do with the faith I got. And I realized looking back, maybe or maybe not, I was supposed to do those things, but I just wanted to serve Jesus. And it was many, many years of doing that, but not feeling totally, completely fulfilled that I decided, you know what, I have a heart of St. Paul and Peter, an apostle, like my whole goal, my whole desire forever has been to bring Jesus to the world. And so, you know, that's kind of why I started Catholic Truth and uh, Catholic Truth. I just wanted to amplify the message and bring it, you know, to many, many more people. So I started this nonprofit organization. And I just really tried to make it work. I tried to, you know, do it full time for a year to see if I could even reach people. I mean, on YouTube, I had, I think, 400 subscribers over like three years. <laughs> so it was totally dead. No, but not many people were watching my videos. And I was like, I'm going to go all in for one year. I'm going to try to make it work. I really want to reach a lot of people. And so with one year, I went from 400 subscribers, I think, to something crazy like 7,000. And, um, and then I went from 7,000 to, I think, uh, 14,000. And now this year we went from 14,000 to 35,000. So it's more than doubling every year. And, um, we're reaching millions of people in 50 different countries. And it's like just growing off the charts and that's not including our social media, which is growing and our podcast, which is growing. And we continue to do retreats farther and wider. We've spoken in a lot of different States across this country, Ireland, different places. And so as many on as many platforms as possible, I've wanted to bring Jesus to as many people as possible. And I, I can't, you know, I do that in as many ways as possible, you know, so it's, it's really hard to answer your question. Like, what are the, you know, certain things, because it really does differ for each and every person, everyone has their own hangups. Yeah. And yeah, sure, there are certain things. I actually wrote a book called uh, Why Do You Believe in God? And I took the most common objections to God, to the faith, to the church that I hear, and I put them all in that book. It's actually 15 real conversations with atheists, you know, so and skeptics and people of questions and people have left the faith. So you get to hear what they say, what I say, what they say, what I say, you know, and it's a lot of the common things that you hear sexual abuse, you know, your priests, you know, do this to children. So I'm not Catholic or crusades or inquisition or uh, Galileo, you hate science. And, you know, they're just the typical things that nobody knows anything about. But then when you give them the answers, they're like, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, fine. You know, <laughs> and then they're much more willing to listen. So, Likewise, on the other side, what, what are the common, I know, again, everyone's different here, but do you see commonality in those leaving the faith currently? Those that are saying, I'm done with the church, and here's why. I'm sure you get well, comments like that as well, especially when you're out at retreats or maybe not retreats, but when you're out speaking, do you get people coming to you afterwards saying, let me tell you a story? I mean, that's great what you just said but here's my reality. Do you get anything like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. I actually did a, a Catholic school retreat in New Jersey and I had seven girls come up to me after they were all bawling their eyes out. And uh, apparently I said some things that touched them, but they wanted to talk deeper. And these were Catholic school girls, good Catholic school girls, you know, not, you know, the, the bad ones. And they were all having doubts in God. 
because of pain and suffering in their life. You know, one had their grandmother die. Another, you know, their dad had cancer. You know, everyone had their story of stuff they were struggling with and they couldn't understand where God was in their suffering and pain. And, you know, if these kids aren't reached with where they're at, they're, ne- they're going to go. They're going to leave. And one of the biggest reasons people leave the faith is because we have not given them any good reasons to stay. We have not taught them their faith in a way that makes sense, in a way where they can put the whole puzzle together and say, oh, I get it. It makes sense. And we have not taught them to pray in a way that changes their life, if we've taught them to pray at all. Most people don't even pray, which is why they leave. Because if you don't have a spiritual life and you start encountering problems and catastrophes in life or questions and doubts and difficulties, then you don't have a firm foundation. You're going. So between lack of prayer and lack of knowledge, I think those are the two biggest reasons that people leave. But also laziness, uh, don't want to follow authority. And why should I have to? My parents haven't raised me in the faith. They didn't tell me I've had to, you know, so, and now you're trying to tell me I have to do this and do that. And a lot of people just don't want to follow the rules. That's the reality of it. Or they don't like some moral laws or, you know, some moral teachings and stuff like that. But, you know, these are a lot of the biggest reasons, but a lot of today, a lot of people are scandalized. They don't like the corruption in the church. They don't like a lot of the bad things that are happening in church, which is totally understandable. Uh, they talk about the sex abuse scandals. Yeah. Uh, what they don't realize, you know, the media is always bringing up sex abuse scandals. This priest did this, this priest did that. But what most people don't realize is that the majority of this, like 90 plus 95% of it happened 30 to 50 years ago. Like it's not happening today. Even the cases that the media is bringing up did not happen and do not happen today. You know, the majority of cases happened 30 to 50 years ago. And people will say, yeah, but look what the priests did to those kids. You know, I don't want to be part of a church where priests, you know, do that to kids. And I said, well, that's everywhere. That's in the public schools. That's in Protestant churches, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, colleges, everywhere has that kind of, you know, bad people in it. But I was like, the reality is the Catholic church is not that. It was only 1.2% of all priests in the height of the scandals. All the statistics say that it was 1.2% of priests, which means it's the tiny vast minority of priests and a tiny vast minority of bishops and other corrupt priests who covered it up, which was evil as well. I was like, the majority of priests are not like that. The majority of priests would not do that. I was like, the majority of priests over the last 30, 50 years have been good. Sure, there has been a sort of a influx of bad priests since the 1960s. And I go on to tell them why that is and uh, the problems in the church at the time. But I was like, that's not the Catholic church. This is a small period of time. The Catholic church is 2000 years old. I was like, the Catholic church was started by Jesus. The Catholic church made the Bible. The Catholic church civilized the barbarians and the Vikings that nobody else could civilize on this earth by bringing them Jesus. Catholic church invented the university systems and started hospitals and orphanages and have fed more people, clothed more people, educated more people and helped more people on planet earth than any and all other organizations over the last 2000 years. So I was like, if you want to talk about the mountain, I mean, so many times we just focus on a couple of the bad things that happen and we don't look at all the good stuff of what our church actually is. So really it's just clearing up a lot of their misconceptions, you know, because a lot of people say, oh, there's corruption. Okay. Jesus never said to leave the church if there's corruption. Judas was corrupt. Judas was a thief, a liar, a murderer. He's the one who got Jesus killed. And yet the apostles didn't say, look at Judas. I'm leaving the church. He is a scandal. I can't believe you would even be part of this because of him. You know, it's like, we don't, judge the church based on people like Judas. That is not what the church is. Those are the people who don't live the faith that Jesus is calling us to. We base the church on people who do live the faith, follow it the way it's supposed to be lived and follow Jesus Christ the way they're supposed to. Excellent. I'll end uh, with one more question. Um, When people come to you with the question of authority, I, I go by the Bible, rule of faith, case closed, how do you respond typically to, to help them understand authority in the form of magisterium, in the form of sacred tradition, and that three-legged stool? Well, I say we go to the Bible for authority too. The Bible is authoritative. We do believe it's the word of God. We do believe it's inerrant, and it does have authority. I mean, it's a supreme authority, but it's not the only or the final authority. It can't be because it's not self-interpreting. It doesn't tell us how to interpret it, which means people say, oh, well, you follow the church. That's man-made. I go by the word of God, which means they go by their own man-made interpretation of the word of God. (laughs) You know, it's like as if God can't guide the church. They say, well, 
you go by the church, the men, men are infallible, you know, I mean, are fallible, not infallible. Yeah. I said, really? I was like, what about the men who wrote the Bible? Were they fallible or infallible when they wrote the Bible? You know, and of course, God used them infallibly to write sacred scripture. So God can use men infallibly. But the reality is the Bible didn't even exist until almost the year 400. They didn't have the Bibles. They may have heard one book of the Bible in their entire life, and they only heard it read because there weren't Bibles. And even when there were Bibles, if they were so rare because they took three years to copy and they took like the salary of your house to buy. So nobody had them. They kept them in churches and they chained them there so that nobody would steal them. <laughs> and they, in fact, in England, they still chain books to the pulpits in the university. So people don't steal them. But the reality is the church, Jesus started a teaching and preaching authoritative church. That's why when you go through the book of Acts, and there's problems like in Acts 15, they don't say, oh, just consult the scriptures. Go, go figure out for yourself what you think it means and come back and tell us so we can argue about it. No, the apostles went and they met and they came to an authoritative decision. In Acts 15, 11, Peter came down and gave that decision. And it says, everyone fell silent. Everything you see throughout the first 100 years of the church are teaching, are the apostles teaching and preaching with the authority that Christ gave them. And that church was passed on and that authority was passed on through the laying on of hands down through the ages. And it was with that authority that we created the Bible. It was the Catholic church in the council of Rome in 382 and the council of Carthage finalized in 397 that the Catholic church chose which books would be in the Bible which books were scripture and which ones were not be. There were way more than four gospels. There were, I think, at least 80. And they said, these are the books that are scripture. And so they made the Bible, they canonized it, and they copied it for over a thousand years and translated it into different languages so we could always have it. So do we love the word of God? Absolutely. Do we read the word of God? Absolutely. But it can't be the final authority on all matters. One, because it doesn't say it is. <laughs> and that's something that Protestants read into the Bible. And two, because Jesus started a church and it's the church that has the authority to interpret the Bible correctly. The same church that had the authority to make it infallibly, to canonize it infallibly under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is the same one that has the authority to interpret it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean we can't read it and come to some conclusions and Jesus can't speak to us through it because of course he can. You know, but when you say, oh, it's the only and final authority, what you're saying is I become Pope now because this is the way I read the Bible. And that's what Luther did. And Calvin disagreed with his interpretation and Zwingli disagreed with them. And the Anabaptists disagreed with all of them. By the time Luther died, there were over 240 new religions, all claiming to be right, all claiming to pray to the Holy Spirit, all claiming to be led by the Holy Spirit and all contradicting each other. And now we have tens of thousands of denominations all claiming to be right. But from the beginning, 2000 years, there's been one one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That was a mouthful. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, it's authority, but it's not the final authority on all matters. Great answer. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Pillar and bulwark of truth, the church. Exactly. Not, not the Bible. One Timothy 315. Thank you. There you go. That's it. <laughs> Brian, thank you for this time. You're... <laughs> You're on fire, man. I got to consult you uh, more often. I, I appreciate that. And you sharing some of those dark days of your uh, childhood. So I really yeah. appreciate that. Keep up no the problem. good work. Yeah, keep up the good work. Um, all of you, I'm, I'm sure most of you truly have heard of Catholic Truth. If not, I'm going to link to his channel. And yeah, support Brian, go to his website, take a look at everything else that he's doing that we didn't have a chance to discuss today. And until next time, take care and God bless. Bye.